Okay, welcome everyone to the season one finale of MythBust Monday. So far in this series, we've picked apart 25 fitness ideas and determined whether they're debunked or if there is in fact some scientific legitimacy to them. Um, so I'm actually gonna break this up into two parts. Um, so in this video, I'm gonna blast through the first 10 myths and cover them on a sort of quick need to know basis. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, uh, let's dig right in. Okay, so up first is the idea that high protein diets are bad for your bones and kidneys. Now, the osteoporosis claim is, in fact, based on a handful of old, outdated studies from the 70s and 80s using outdated methodology. And according to a 2017 systematic review from the National Osteoporosis Foundation, drawing on newer data with improved methodology, now the body of evidence shows that the effect of dietary protein on the skeleton appears to be favorable to a small extent and is not detrimental. Now, when it comes to kidney function, in 2007, the World Health Organization concluded that while there is clear evidence that a high intake of protein by patients already with renal disease contributes to the deterioration of kidney function, now reducing protein in healthy subjects appears to have no foundation. Okay, so up next is the so-called post-workout anabolic window. And there are two main problems with this idea. Uh, the first is that assuming you've eaten a normal pre-workout meal containing protein, uh, the amino acids from that meal will still be available for delivery to the muscles in the post-workout period, implying that the pre-workout meal can function as both a pre and an immediate post-exercise meal. Uh, the second problem is that resistance training stimulates a prolonged elevation in muscle protein synthesis that lasts at least 48 hours after training, and that the initial spike in sensitivity appears to be about two and a half to three hours. So Schoenfeld and others have suggested that there is in fact a roughly four to six hour window around training with both the pre and post-workout meals included. Now with that said, there are some situations where I think you should consume protein as quickly as you can after training, such as when training fasted or if you train twice in the same day. But in general, I would say it is much more important to focus on hitting a total daily protein target rather than worrying about the specific timing around training. Now, sugar is a big one. Uh, I actually had to do two videos to adequately cover it. And I'd say there were probably two of my most hotly contested videos this year. Um, so for now, I'll just simply say that sugar can certainly make it much easier to overconsume total calories, but sugar itself doesn't appear to play a causative role in either obesity or type two diabetes. And this is clear looking at the NHANES data from 1980 to 2013. Since 1999, sugar intake has actually decreased, yet rates of obesity have continued to rise. And I think that instead of villainizing a single nutrient like sugar or fat or what have you, uh, we really need to look at the diet and lifestyle as a whole, uh, being especially cautious with very calorie dense, highly palatable, and highly processed foods in general. As a rough ballpark figure, the World Health Organization recommends that sugar occupy no more than 10% of total calories, uh, but this figure is based on prevention of dental caries, and I personally prefer Alan Aragon's recommendation of 50 grams of fructose as an upper limit, which, if estimated as roughly half the total sugar intake, would mean about 100 grams of total sugar per day, uh, which should be fine for otherwise healthy, active individuals. Now, this next one is pretty cut and dry. Uh, the weight training stunts growth myth gets its origin from some observational data from the 1960s, which found that Japanese child laborers tended to be very short in stature. Uh, but of course, correlation doesn't imply causation. And since then, pretty much every regulatory body has come to the consensus position stand that no scientific evidence indicates that resistance training will have adverse effects on growth during childhood or adolescence. Uh, so it's actually really easy to bust this myth if we just focus on the word absorb, uh, because the body has a virtually unlimited ability to absorb amino acids from the gut into the blood. Um, so say if you ate 500 grams of protein in one meal, uh, pretty much all of it would be absorbed. Uh, but I think the real question is how much protein can you use in a single meal for muscle building? And it's funny, uh, just one month after I published my original MythBust video on this, uh, this study was published answering this exact question. Uh, so just quickly emphasizing their main conclusion, one should consume 0.4 to 0.55 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per meal spread across four meals per day. Um, so for a 80 kilogram or 175 pound individual, you'd wanna eat 32 to 44 grams of protein per meal 
spread across four meals a day. Now, with that said, some research on intermittent fasting does suggest that you can still maximize your muscle building potential by simply eating all of your protein at once. And in the real world, I would say that intermittent fasting adherents who eat, say, 80 or 100 grams or more of protein in a single meal uh, don't seem to have any trouble building muscle. Uh, but if we just set that intermittent fasting stuff aside, uh, my best guess would be that the maximum amount probably lands somewhere between 20 to 40 grams of protein for most people. Uh, but again, I think total daily protein intake should take priority over distribution or specific timing. So the main takedown against fasted cardio is that just because you burn more fat during a cardio session itself doesn't imply that you'll lose more fat overall, like say over a 24 hour period. And Paoli and colleagues showed that if you burn more fat during a cardio session, you'll burn less fat over the next 24 hours. And just borrowing from the conclusions of a 2017 systematic review, fasted compared to fed exercise doesn't increase the amount of weight loss and fat mass loss. Uh, but still, there doesn't seem to be any real specific harm to doing fasted cardio. Uh, it doesn't seem to negatively impact muscle mass, for example. Um, so my suggestion is to do cardio when it best fits your schedule or when you feel like you have the best energy to get the job done while keeping in mind that it will be net 24 hour energy balance that'll ultimately determine how much fat you actually lose. So carbs eaten before bed are thought to make you fat because your metabolism is thought to slow down as you sleep, uh, but this simply isn't true. Uh, research shows that while sleep metabolic rate tends to be lower than resting metabolic rate for obese subjects, it's actually higher than resting metabolic rate in healthy non-obese subjects. Um, also, dietary carbohydrate is not readily converted to body fat to begin with. Uh, this is a process known as de novo lipogenesis, and it's actually pretty uncommon in humans. Uh, so I think it's much smarter to eat according to a schedule that works best according to your preferences, your schedule, and your appetite, while being mindful of the fact that snacking late at night due to sleep deprivation or watching TV uh, can lead to overconsumption of calories, which will, of course, hinder your fat loss goals. As a whole, the research on foam rolling is actually extremely mixed. Uh, some studies show a reduction in muscle soreness, while others show no benefit, especially when combined with regular dynamic stretching. And similar conflicts hold for range of motion. Uh, many studies do show improvements in range of motion. However, again, these effects may be negated when foam rolling is combined with a simple dynamic stretching routine. And on the whole, it seems that a good warm-up that includes dynamic stretching appears to be enough on its own for preventing injury and improving recovery. Uh, but still, since there doesn't seem to be any real detriment to foam rolling, I personally still do it for two to three minutes before training, especially on leg days and if my muscles are feeling a bit tighter than usual. Now, so energy drinks definitely can cause harm. I think that the main potentially harmful ingredients in them are sugar and caffeine. And sugar, while probably not the villain it's made out to be in moderation, can easily lead to overconsumption of these nutrient devoid empty calories, especially in fluid form. Um, so if you are gonna drink energy drinks, I'd go with the diet option, since you'd have to drink 32 cans of diet drink just to get your adequate daily intake of ACE-K, and six cans to get the ADI for sucralose, which is itself a very conservative estimate based on consumption across a lifetime. Caffeine can actually be very beneficial at moderate doses when it comes to energy, focus, performance, etc., uh, but can lead to cardiovascular problems if overconsumed. Uh, Health Canada recommends no more than 400 milligrams of caffeine per day. Uh, so just try to moderate and monitor your own consumption and exactly how safe energy drinks are for you will depend on your age, activity level, heart condition, uh, whether or not you're pregnant and so forth. Um, so there's no definitive answer here and whether or not you are personally comfortable with consuming them will depend on your level of risk aversion as much as anything. Personally, I'm of the opinion that moderate consumption is fine for non-pregnant, otherwise healthy and active adults. Okay, uh, last myth here. Uh, so while it is true that metabolism does slow down as you lose weight, uh, there's no point at which fat loss completely stalls or reverses despite being on very low calories. And this is obvious in the real world where you see that people who are in fact starving look emaciated with extremely low body fat percentages and they don't enter starvation mode and suddenly stop losing weight. And I think a more science-based explanation for why you may not be losing weight despite dieting on low calories uh, probably comes down to one of three main possibilities. Uh, the first is that you're actually eating more than you think you are. Uh, 
Uh, people are notoriously bad at tracking and reporting food intake, uh, with overweight people tending to underreport the most. Uh, secondly, water retention could be masking your true fat loss, uh, meaning if you're stressed, not sleeping well, eating too much fiber, etc., uh, you could be holding water mass while simultaneously losing fat mass, making it appear as though your fat loss has stalled. And thirdly, the very low calorie diet could be suppressing spontaneous physical activity. So stuff like fidgeting, walking around, etc. And as a result, decreasing your total daily energy expenditure subconsciously. All right, so guys, that's the first 10 fitness myths busted in hopefully 10 minutes. Uh, like I said, I skipped many of the details here. And of course, you'll wanna keep in mind that like many of these myths, they're not completely busted. Uh, many of these actually have quite a bit of truth to them. Uh, so just because they're on the list doesn't mean they're false in all circumstances. And these issues are rarely black and white or true or false. Um, anyway, two Mondays from now, I'll be doing the remaining 15 myths covered in the series. Please subscribe if you happen to be new. Uh, hit the like button if you found the video informative and I'll see you guys all here next Monday.